Right, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about open digital architecture for zero-touch operations automation. What I'm going to talk about this afternoon is some work that we started in late 2014 and uh, give you some idea of some of the results we've got, including APIs and uh, other supporting technical documentations that address this space. So we see today an evolution of OSS and BSS through four phases. Uh, notably, the length of each phase is shortening. Uh, the first phase of OSS BSS 1.0, which I'll abbreviate to OSS 1.0 in the interest of time, um, basically was uh, about a 20-year period, and when we get to OSS 4.0, we're talking about something which might be less than three years. OSS uh, 1.0 is characterized by early implementation of FCAPS-based management um, and uh, using vendor-supplied NMS and EMS uh, using vendor, uh, using telecom-specific IT solutions. And that's where many companies still are today, using those kinds of solutions, which have proven the test of time. OSS 2.0 moved, uh, moved uh, to a use of more mainstream IT best-of-breed products with integration based on SOA and telecoms models such as the TM Forum information model and the TM Forum uh, business process framework. And the TM Forum was formed at about this point in time, and most people in the industry have not been following us particularly closely, regard us as being in that sort of uh, space and that point in time, which is probably incorrect. However, the results of 3.0, uh, OSS 3.0, which we're roughly completing at this particular point in time, uh, is about service providers becoming a business enabler for platform-based business models to support ecosystems of their partners and also to address the issue of systems rationalization. And I'll talk to that a little bit later. Moving from OSS 3.0 to 4.0, this is about radical simplification of OSS and BSS using high cohesion uh, architectures based on adoption of new operating methods, in the main using things like AI, machine learning, big data, and distributed modern cloud technologies. I'd like to move to uh, a, a brief overview of our open digital architecture, which we've recently announced. Uh, basically, the goals that we've set ourselves for this initiative is to address two issues. One is business agility and the operational impacts of uh, agility. In the uh, business agility area, we're looking at being able to introduce services rapidly, supporting ecosystem partnerships, and also to adopt uh, new technologies more rapidly and with lower integration costs. Operationally, we're trying to extend the automation from the traditional operational processes which support essentially customer orders or customer requirements to also include life cycle processes, commercial, operational and technical, and enterprise processes like security and revenue assurance and revenue risk management. We also know that we need to move to an, a completely different model of agile processes. Now, the key solution principles that we've identified is that we need to design in a decoupling between the products that the services, uh, products and services that service providers offer, uh, from the supporting technologies. I'll talk to this a bit later. Uh, our Australian colleagues who are leading this from Telstra have a neat phrase called circuit breaker, which I have to say I quite like because it's saying we need a point that isolates this part of the business from that part of the business. We need to have zero touch automation of operational life cycle and enterprise functions, and we need to enable vendor innovation. I think this point's much overlooked. We tend to talk about standards, but we need to standardize the vital few standards that we need to get agility in an organization. We don't need to standardize everything. We do actually need the vendors to be able to innovate and supply those solutions into service providers and for those to be integrated rapidly and at low cost. Technically, what we're seeing is a radical simplification of OSS and BSS, which is based on whether you call it platforms or domains, I don't think really matters. 
The move towards cloud native infrastructure, um, this is actually quite important and it has a radical effect on how you deliver OSS and BSS. These will eventually migrate to be platforms or applications running on cloud native principles. And the reason is really quite simple because of the level of investment that's taking place in those areas. It will be irresistible for service providers to move in that direction. Also virtualization, which we've mentioned, um, we believe the integration of OSS and BSS will be largely based on APIs and microservices, and I'll talk to that a bit later. And we think the way the flexibility will come around is by some form of model-driven integration by the use of configuration. Operationally, we need to migrate processes from procedural to intent-based approaches, which I'll speak about a bit later, using knowledge, AI, machine learning, and data lake-based approaches. And another critical aspect operationally is to move towards the use of closed control loops, which was picked up by several other earlier speakers, including uh, Marcus and uh, also um, Francisco. We have a couple of uh, analyst reports or reports you can have a look at that goes into this in a bit more detail. So within the ODA, Open Digital Architecture, we're considering two viewpoints. The first of these is a functional architecture, which doesn't look too different from things you'll have seen before, but it's actually about a layered model focusing on exposed services. So this is less about the functionality and more about the services these expose. And this is very much aligned with Sue's earlier presentation about what Vodafone are doing. Uh, with their uh, move towards exposed services. The other thing is a clear separation of domain-specific resource-facing services from the things that are actually customer-facing in order to get the decoupling and this circuit breaker kind of capability. And on the right-hand side, what we're seeing increasingly is the need to be able to bring in services from third parties and to integrate those into the end-to-end -end customer propositions. And that's uh, quite subtle, and we have quite a lot of assets in that area. And there's a recognition that we're going to need common models for security, data, and governance across the whole of this uh, functional view. Moving to the second view that we're looking at, <clears throat> obviously agility comes about by being able to make change quickly in an organization. So we've identified some work that we published, I think, nearly a decade ago on a life cycle, some of which were... Uh, reviewing with a view to reintroducing some of this material in a slightly fresher cloud environment. What this allows us to do is to separate the business architecture concerns from the enterprise architecture concerns from the implementation and from the runtime. And it turns out that when we look at this, uh, we do need to have some principles which go around the whole of this life cycle. But what our ODA work is to figure out what are the principles that allow us to transit around these life cycles in timescales that are of interest to service providers, like days and weeks as opposed to years. Now, we actually have quite a lot of historical assets in this area. Our frameworks material is particularly well known, and our ODA functional architecture has a strong relationship with the frameworks activity. We have some business architecture tools called Curate FX that allow people to construct business models based on our enterprise architecture artifacts and allows them to reason about the kind of business problems they're trying to address. We also have a lot of assets, and I'm going to talk more about these, about open APIs. These are very important, and we have an open API program, which you can find on our website, which is basically focused on management platforms. And we have a component uh, model that we're developing using our open APIs, using, uh, the, the using uh, basically uh, ODA components. There are some references on here to prior material, which you can have a look at. So moving on to zero touch or operations and automation. <clears throat> we started this work off in about 2014, the end of 2014. And we ran 20 catalysts over the period of, uh, I think, 2015, which is shown here on the left-hand side. Out of that, two really important concepts emerged. One was in a document called IG 1139. And my understanding is that most of our IG documents will become publicly available within the next month or so. It's about end-to-end multi-level orchestration. And it defines an orchestration architecture using federation of domains and autonomic closed control loops. And the second document, which was quite seminal coming out of these 20 catalysts, was about closed control, control loop architectures. And it documents the main concepts of dynamic control loops, and it leverages intent-based management APIs. So those were really the seminal documents that we started off with. 
Now, the reality in service providers, and this is a slide that comes from Telstra, who are now leading most of the activity in this area. I should actually add at this point, we actually have three main areas we're looking at. One is about the uh, zero touch, the, um, the kind of operational process area. We're also looking at the onboarding commercially and technically, which I'm not going to cover in this presentation. But in the slide pack that you'll receive, there, is some, there are some pointers to that. And the other area we've been looking at is cultural changes, which includes things like DevOps and joint agile DevOps between organizations. We have some interesting API results in that area. But you can follow those in the slide pack that uh, accompanies this uh, set. But essentially, the key point that Telstra made in this slide, and we've run a couple of uh, a couple of web webinars and also conferences on this, is that on the left-hand side, the reality is that the IT assets in a service provider are very tightly integrated and coupled with the networking assets, which is a point that Francisco Javier made, I think, as well. And what the proposal is to move to the idea of a network as a service model on the right-hand side, which abstracts a lot of this detail away from the current OSS and BSS. And the implication of that is that the networking departments need to be more software literate and need to build up their software skills, which I think is happening if you look in the leading companies. And there needs to be an agreement struck between essentially the networking departments and the IT departments on what those networks as a services actually would be. And that's really where we're going to come on to some of the ideas that we're developing in this area about developing network domains that both manage the exposed operational service, i.e. what it does from a connectivity point of view or an application point of view, but also allows you to manage the life cycle of those items. You need to get a little bit of push on. Now, there is a, an interesting point about this. Traditionally, management's been organized vertically. What this means is that we're going to move to horizontal operations where the networking pieces are managed ortho effectively horizontally and separate from things that are facing the customers. It also means that the virtualization stuff that you heard earlier uh, will be a layer not only under the networking part, but because the OSS part is also uh, software-based, you will see similar virtualization and cloud-native solutions for the OSS part, which is shown at the top of this diagram. So the thinking that we've developed in the TM Forum, which has been validated in quite a few catalysts, is to come up with the concept of a management platform or domain management, which is some form of scope. And this is being validated by work by BT, Vodafone, and Orange in our, uh, in our uh, programs of work. And in the case of BT, they've reported that using this kind of approach, they've removed about 2,000 operation support systems in a decade. So there is something behind this, this simple model. The idea is to expose a defined set of systems or cap business capabilities by open APIs, and we're promoting our open APIs, TM Forum open APIs, with which we now have 52, which are just being published. I think 30 of them have been published on Apache 2 licenses, and they are publicly available. About 11 of those are relevant to the rest of this conversation. These APIs have been adopted by the MEF, so the MEF is adding their payload into our APIs by the Fireware group, which is in the um, uh, IoT space. And I'll talk to the ONAP Beijing release too, where we've got some traction in that area. But what we found is that the APIs are developed generically, and we need to introduce the idea of platform capabilities, which allow us to group those for specific business purposes, for specific stakeholders and specific, specific business purposes. So running through this slide, which comes originally from Vodafone, what we're trying to do is to create a pattern of platforms that have exposed capabilities based on APIs. So the capabilities are the unit of integration and the APIs are the unit of interoperability. We're going to apply that pattern uniformly across the whole of the um, uh, OSS, BSS, and also networking state. Now, what's important from the ODM point of view, which uh, Telstra are pushing, is to find the layer which is technology independent and vendor independent, shown in the middle of this. That's the critical area where we need to get agreement between the, uh, the IT departments and the networking departments. And we need to evolve out some definitions of networks as a service. We do have some definitions, but they need road testing with more examples, which we're in the process of doing at the moment. So there, there are three 
value stream viewpoints for platforms. There's the what view, which is why is this plat what does this platform do, which could be to say manage connectivity services or VCDN, or VCDN services. And these are basically capabilities that fundamentally support the product manager, put together the ability to deliver tenant services or instance of these services to customers. You'll see a little icon here, which is in fact a business process framework. These are effectively capabilities that support the operation side of our business process framework. And that's where the NAS view would be. This is about managing instances of NAS services for customers. The other view is the how viewpoint, which is really about how do we operate this. And I'll come to this in the next slide. But it's largely the pieces that are on the... Sorry, I should go back. It's largely the pieces in what we call strategy, infrastructure, and product part of our process framework. And equally important are enterprise management activities, which are shown in the enterprise part of our business process framework. All of this is being derived from an extensive piece of work on user stories. And in the security area, shown on the left-hand side, we've got a model which is a software-defined perimeter model, which we published about a year ago. So if I look at an example of a what viewpoint, what we've done in our documents is take an abstracted view of a service. So this is a, this is a content delivery network, which basically is a kind of a black box with a series of endpoints. And customers want to establish particular kinds of flows across this, and they do that by features that they can ask when they place an order for these features to be either put in place or not. Now, what that means is that internally, however, that abstract black box view is actually requires another internal topology which would correspond to VNFs and network services. And we also need to describe the rules for creating flows. And that requires us to map between the CDN features and the constraints that have been established from the operational how viewpoint. And we've defined these in a document called TR255 A and B, and we have examples in the TMF 070 series. So that's basically the the kind of where we're coming from. We think we need to have platforms, a simple abstraction model, which supports three kinds of value streams, and we have quite a few of the APIs in place, as I will mention just in a moment. So also covered in our documentation, but not today, is a whole series of technical topics which we have uh, put captured in a number of documents covering implementation functions, closed control loops, atomic composite concepts, orchestration constraints, modeling for decoupling products and resources, and implementing APIs. So I just want to move on to a uh, piece of work that we're doing with the ONAP community. This diagram will be uh, familiar to some of you. What we're delivering, or rather our members are delivering, is a set of three APIs, which are the service ordering, service inventory, and service catalog, into the uh, ONAP community. And essentially what we're doing is we're building the how viewpoint, the, the what viewpoint, as a, as a kind of a wrapper around the uh, ONAP uh, community. What is happening at the moment is there's an integration of those APIs happening as we speak into some of the internal modules of the, um, of the uh, ONAP community. But what we did discover is that we can use our service ordering API to also support the data models that are in SOL 3 and 5. And the reason for that is that our APIs are very similar to the Etsy APIs. The design guidelines that are use, used in Etsy correspond to our release 2 guidelines, whereas we've moved on to some release 3 guidelines, which enables us to use the same APIs with different payloads in different places. What we're considering is bringing another set of APIs into the Casablanca release, which gets kicked off next week. These are just candidates, but we have a number of other uh, APIs which are available on our website that we're considering using. This gives you some idea of the documentation we've produced. The bottom half of this is the sets of APIs that we have available right now on our website. Um, I'm sure as we develop additional examples, we'll make some iterations in these areas because it's a try a bit, do a bit, specify a bit uh, cycle. So finally, I'd just like to summarize roughly where we're at is that our open digital architecture, which is an umbrella around a lot of existing artifacts, is focused on business agility and has two aspects, a functional architecture, which leverages a number of our existing assets and a life cycle model. In the Zoom project, what we're addressing is agile service and resource management within that ODA uh, or operation, open digital architecture 
uh, the, the functional architecture. And we're looking at intent-based management APIs, the ability to support hybrid physical and network, uh, physical and virtualized networks. We're covering northbound uh, connectivity services. We're covering s fulfillment and assurance through closed control loops. And we're also supporting horizontal life, star life cycle changes. And um, what it also does is create a simplified NAS abstraction between the networks and IT, and the operational domain manager work that we're kicking off will address the industrialization and the adoption at scale of some of these results, obviously with modification from what we learn, through a reference implementation. Okay, so that's all I have to cover today. Thank you for your attention. I think we just finished in time. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'd be interested to know, it's more for my information, the difference between a, a dynamic control loop and a closed control loop. Um, I'm well, familiar with closed they're, control they're related. So a closed control loop can be implemented in a static way. There is actually a slide in the uh, published pack that talks about closed control loops. But what we've seen is from several of our catalysts, the need to be able to change the behavior of those control loops based on uh, broader conditions. So one example, which I think was done by Huawei, was an uh, example of where you've got preset plans for the closed control loops, and you make decisions as to which plan to run based on decisions which are not within just that one platform, but maybe aware of the wider network situation that you want this to run and behave slightly differently. So that's where we, we uh, mean what we mean by dynamic. And also our APIs are polymorphic, which means that we can dynamically change the behavior and the data payloads in the APIs. Uh, that's something which uh, is new in our design guidelines. Sorry. So we think we, to make agility work, we think everything's got to be thought through from the mindset of everything gets changed at runtime through configuration. Absolutely. Please thank Dave for the best standards body presentation I think I've ever seen. Thank you very much, Dave.